What's the question? Which one of you will hurt me? And bachelor number three, I'm counting on you. What are girls for? Anna Kendrick's directorial debut of the Netflix film Woman of the Hour explores one of the most bizarre moments in TV history when serial killer Rodney Alcala wins a date on the 1970s game show The Dating Game. Law and Crime brought you Alcala's story in an episode of I Survived a Serial Killer when we had the chance to talk to survivors and the lead investigative team on the case. In September of 1978, Rodney Alcala is on parole. He is a convicted sex offender and he goes on a dating game show. The arrogance to actually go on television in front of the whole country looking for more women. Will that date be bachelor number one, bachelor number two, or bachelor number three? Who gets the dates? Well, I like bananas, so I'll take one. Number one, bachelor number one, all right. Well. Say hello to Rodney Alcala. Rodney, come on, say hello. Congratulations, Rod. You did it with the one answer. But for Kendrick's Netflix film, it's told through the eyes of real-life contestant Cheryl Bradshaw as it captures her eerie encounter with Alcala, which she was fortunate enough to survive. A bachelor number one. I am serving you for dinner. What are you called, and what do you look like? I'm called the banana, and I look really good. Uh, can you be a little more descriptive? Peel me. In the episode of The Game Show, which aired back in 1978, Bradshaw and Alcala engaged in playful banter, eventually leading her to ultimately pick him as a suitable date. But it was a date she later decided not to go on. It was a decision that ultimately may have saved her life. The violent serial killer and sex offender was linked to the murders of seven women and one girl across three states. But authorities believe the actual number of victims could be as high as 130. So how accurate is the Netflix film? Cheryl Bradshaw in the Netflix film is described as a serious actress who has done stage work in New York and decided to move to L.A. to get into the film industry. But as an actress, casting directors pressured her to perform nude, which she refused. And in turn, it held her back from getting certain casting opportunities. Here is a young lady with a wealth of experience. She once earned a living massaging feet, but she quit when her boss suggested that she work her way up. Then she taught school in Phoenix, Arizona. Now she's here to educate our three bachelors in the art of amour. Welcome, if you will, sensational Cheryl Bradshaw. Here's what we know about the real Cheryl, who in real life spelled her name with a C instead of an S. She's described as having once earned a living as a foot monsieur and was an inspiring actress. But when it came to the Netflix film, Anna Kendrick told People magazine she didn't have much to go on. And the film's character really is an imagined version of the real 1970s woman, as there's very little public information about the real Cheryl's life before the dating game. Number one, would you say hello to Cheryl, please? We're going to have a great time together, Cheryl. As for the murderer, Rodney Alcala, one minor detail that was changed in the film was the order in which he appeared as a contestant. In the film, he's named as Bachelor Number Three, but in the real episode, he was actually Bachelor Number One. Bachelor Number One is a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the dark room at the age of 13, fully developed. <laughs> Between takes, he might find him skydiving or motorcycling. Please welcome Rodney Alcala. Rod, welcome. This detail was likely changed to build up the suspense when Alcala was finally announced. In the film, he was introduced as a man who worked at the LA Times, but in real life, he was introduced as a professional photographer. Before his appearance on the dating show, there's a scene in the film that depicts Alcala working at the Times in 1977. The scene depicts Alcala showing off images of his photography collection of women, many of whom were naked. But it turns out Alcala actually did work at the LA Times, not as a photographer, but as a typesetter. In a 2020 episode, it was revealed that he did apparently bring in photos of nude women into the office, though these were reportedly seen as artistic in nature and not as a warning sign of something dark to come. Bachelor number one. Yes. What's your best time? The best time is at night, nighttime. Why do you say that? Because that's the only time there is. The only time? What's wrong with uh, morning, afternoon? 
Well, they're okay, but night times when it really gets good, then you're really ready. In the film, when Alcala makes his appearance in the fictionalized taping of the dating game episode, he says he studied at NYU with infamous film director Roman Polanski, and it turns out this is only partially true. Alcala did actually enroll at NYU, but he did not actually complete his studies there. It's unclear if the murderer actually ever crossed paths with Polanski. And in a shocking scene, a woman in the audience has a panic attack after recognizing Alcala as a man who had approached her and her friend on a beach the day before her friend is murdered. She tells a security guard she needs to speak with the show's producer, but she's never able to do so. But this scene never happened in real life. The director, Anna Kendrick, told Rolling Stone magazine this character was actually a composite meant to represent people who attempted to report Alcala over the years and were ignored. You ask them anything you like to find out more about them except their name, age, occupation, or income, okay? When it came time to ask her mystery suitors questions on the dating show in real life, which was heavy on sexual innuendo, the questions were all scripted by the show's producers. And I'm going to audition each of you for my private class. Bachelor number one, you're a dirty old man. Take it. Come on, over here. <sighs> but in Women of the Hour, Kendrick opted to have her character come up with her own questions to The Bachelors, which she said veered away from the show's superficial and at times sexist nature. As to why Kendrick had her character ask her own questions, Tony Hale, the actor who played game show host Jim Lang, told USA Today, that was a great device Anna used to show how this character's opportunity to turn the tables on that sexist culture, even if in the end it does bring her closer to that dangerous place because it leads her to pick Rodney. Another creepy scene in the film just before the taping begins involves Alcala telling Bachelor number two, Jed Mills, I always get the girl. But at the end of the episode, when Cheryl makes her choice, as the losing bachelors each kiss her goodbye, Mills is seen whispering to her a warning about her chosen date. She didn't choose number two, who did a fine acting job as a virgin maiden. He is uh, an actor, a skin diver from New York City. Say hi to Jed Mills. Jed, come on and meet Cheryl. So did this really happen? It's not clear if Mills ever did warn Cheryl, but he later told reporters he had serious reservations about Alcala. He told 2020 Alcala was creepy, definitely creepy, and that Alcala did indeed say to him that he always gets the girl in the green room. Mills also told CNN in March of 2010 that he had been creeped out by Alcala, recalling there was something about him and he could not be near him. In the film, Cheryl makes her match. Well, as far as I can see, Cheryl and Rodney, it looks like the two of you may be involved in some sort of racket. So we're going to have you take to the court. Oh, first, you'll receive tennis lessons from expert Naomi Besa of the famous Kirkwood Tennis Club. That starts. And you'll soon be acing everyone off the courts. And it'll make sure you both look as professional as you'll become. Complete tennis outfits will be provided by Bill Darling's Tennis Shop. It'll really make you look like part of the racket set. Then it's off to Magic Mountain, one of America's greatest and most complete amusement parks, with plenty of excitement to challenge any daring dater, like the revolution that'll help you turn the town upside down, and of course the world's greatest roller coaster, the Colossus. Magic Mountain, just a half an hour north of Hollywood, California. So have fun playing tennis. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you. Okay. You can go relax, meet each other, say hello, get acquainted. After she picks Alcala, the film shows the two of them going out for a drink, where she becomes uncomfortable when he insists on ordering another round after she has already declined. She then tells the contestant coordinator that she's put off by him and does not wish to see him again. But how accurate is this? In real life, that date never took place, and this was confirmed by the coordinator herself, Ellen Metzger. Mesker told 2020 that Cheryl said to her, quote, Ellen, I can't go out with this guy. There's weird vibes that are coming off of him. He's very strange. I am not comfortable. Is that going to be a problem? To which Mesker told her it would, of course, not be. One huge question lingers. How did Alcala, who was actually a convicted sex offender at the time, even land a spot on the dating game? The movie depicts the producer selecting Alcala for the show without doing any background check at all. And this is entirely true. Before Alcala even went on the show, he had served 34 months in prison for sexually assaulting and beating an eight-year-old girl. And no standardized background checks were in place to uncover this crime. 
So where are there more survivors of this monstrous murderer? The Netflix show focuses on Cheryl Bradshaw, but there were even more women who had near fatal encounters with the serial killer. My name is Morgan Rowan and I survived a serial killer. Morgan Rowan met Rodney Alcala at a house party before his appearance on The Dating Game, and she described the encounter that almost ended her life. I don't or can't remember much of the rape other than his face really close to mine and how animal he looked rather than human. I was fighting pretty hard, but he just lifted me by my hair and punched me in the stomach, and I could feel my ribs breaking. But suddenly there was a whole lot of commotion. Glass break. My friend had broken his bedroom window and I could feel air, cool air. Everybody ran into the room and he was just standing there naked from the waist down with my blood all over his shirt. And he said, take her. Another woman, Tali Shapiro, also detailed her frightening experience when she was just a little girl, years before Alcala ever appeared on the dating game. Pretty much after walking through the front door, I don't recollect anything. After being kidnapped by the serial killer, she was taken to a house where she was assaulted and brutalized. I received a radio message about a possible kidnapping to a residence on DeLong Prey. So two officers came to assist me and I started knocking on the door. I thought she was dead. Thoughts went through my mind. Who could do this to a little girl? What kind of a person is capable of that? So how did Rodney Alcala get caught? The film depicts a scene where Alcala picks up a teenage girl in his car by telling her he is a model scout and shows her photos of women he claims to have discovered. She gets in his car and shortly thereafter, he knocks her to the ground. The next morning, when she wakes up with Alcala, he drives back toward L.A. and stops at a gas station where the girl slips away and Alcala is met with sirens and handcuffed by police. This incident is true. In 1979, Alcala really did pick up 15-year-old Monique Hoyt while she was hitchhiking. She did manage to escape him by telling him she wanted to continue the relationship and she did raise the alarm. Although in real life, police did not arrive on time at the gas station to arrest Alcala at the exact same time. Hoyt even testified during a 2010 trial to determine whether Alcala should receive the death penalty for the rape and murder of four women and a 12-year-old girl. And it was the investigation into the 12-year-old's death that would lead police to Alcala. He didn't care what anybody thought. Approximately a year after this dating game appearance, 12-year-old Marvin Samso was on the beach with her friend and she was approached by a young man who claimed to be a photographer. One of the moms in the neighborhood saw this because it looked creepy and approached this man who kind of scurried off down the beach. A short time later, Robin borrowed a friend's bicycle and she was going to a class. The operating theory is that this man came up and offered her a ride to the ballet lesson. She actually got into his car voluntarily so she wouldn't be late. And she was never seen alive again. On July 2nd, a forest worker found a tennis shoe that belonged to Robin Samso and a human skull. Robin Samso's friend, who actually saw this photographer approach and say, I want to take your picture, met with a forensic sketch artist. And they actually did a composite drawing of the suspect, and this composite drawing was circulated. A parole officer said, hey, you know, I got a parolee. His name is Rodney James Alcala. Uh, he fits this crime signature. You might want to check him out. And right after getting the tip, one of these Huntington Beach detectives turns on the TV, and that was the day that the Dating Game episode aired again. I'll take one. Number one, that's your number one, all right. Congratulations, Rod, you did it with the one answer. And sure enough, it looks like the sketch. Rodney O'Call was arrested soon after that. You can check out more of that episode and more I Survived a Serial Killer streaming on a and &E. Rodney Alcala died of natural causes in July 2021 at the age of 77 while on death row in California. And it's been reported Cheryl Bradshaw passed away before production on Woman of the Hour began. Reporting for Law and Crime, I'm Elizabeth Milner.